Shalom, shalom. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. Sorry for the late start today, but glad to see you uh, here with us. And um, we are um, a minute before time, but that's great. We're going to start a minute early. So, um, Shavua Tov. And I guess as of tonight, Chodesh Tov, uh, moving into the nine days, famously the nine days as we move into Av, headed towards Tisha B'Av, and uh, a time of reflection, um, time of mourning. Yes, if you're just joining now, we're starting literally just now. So um, uh, entering the nine days tonight, time to reflect on brokenness in the world. And one dimension of that, which we're going to explore today, which is kotzer, kotzer. So kotzer, reaping or cutting, reaping or cutting. Okay, so the malach of kotzer, is about removing vegetation from the earth. In the Mishkan, of course, this is once again connected to the gathering of herbs for the dyes and um, in regards to the, the bread. Um, and uh, this is the process of harvesting. And because Kotzer is one of the 39 Malachot, um, is part of these original 11 that's connected to that, once again, we're returning to the focus on the agricultural world. And on a technical level, this has to do with um, taking, taking plant life from wherever it's growing. And so traditionally, one avoids uh, engaging with trees and bushes and flowers on Shabbat with or without a tool uh, to avoid any possible removal of vegetation or fruit from, from its source. So what is it that we are trying to focus on Shabbat in regard to our relationship in cutting plants? on a deeper level. Every aspect of life has roots that provide living things with nourishment. As humans, we have our own physical life sources from which we meet our basic human needs, such as water and food, and well beyond that. And we have our spiritual life sources as well that nourish us. On the latter point, we might investigate what it is exactly that each of us needs in order to be nourished spiritually and connected to our respective souls and to the grand, grander divinity. Rabbi Dr. Arthur, Arthur Green, Art Green, in his book, Eye, Eye, one of the great names of God, means uh, God of becoming rather than a God who is, um, writes over there. He's a, he's, anyways, he's a, I'm sure many of you know who he is. He's a professor um, uh, and a teacher of Kabbalah and, and Hasidut. And he writes that the first sin in the Garden of Eden, the Chait of Gan Eden, um, um, involved, of course, picking fruit, involved an act of kotzer, which was the, um, the quintessential act um, of, of what it means for humanity to, uh, to fail, or as Christianity would say more commonly, fall. Um, and, and here he explores what's at stake there. 
So here I'm going to quote Art Green. The early Kabbalists offer another profound teaching about the tale of Eden. Reading the text closely, they say, shows us that there were two trees at the center of the garden, the tree of knowledge and the tree of life. These two trees were joined to one another, knowledge and life, or creation and revelation, world and Torah, being in their essence one. Adam and Eve's sin was plucking the fruit. In doing so, they separated the two trees, the tree of knowledge and the tree of life, tasting only of knowledge, but in such a way that it was cut off from its root in the tree of life. Their sin was separation, breaking apart the unity of being. The Kabbalists understood the break between the two trees as dividing the spherot, seeking to wor worship the Shekhinah alone, cut off from her deeper roots, within the Godhead. Okay, that's Art Green. So against this Kabbalistic backdrop, which imagines trees as evoking separation rather than cosmic unity, we gain insight into why the rabbis caution the engagement with plants during Shabbat. Consider this Talmudic passage. Rav Yaakov said, one who walks on the road, this is Pirkei Avo, a famous one that I'm, I'm troubled by. <laughs> one who walks on the road while reviewing a Torah lesson, but interrupts his review and exclaims, how beautiful is this tree? How be beautiful is this plowed field? Scripture considers it as if he bears guilt for his soul. Okay, so that's very troubling. Think about that. The person walking down the road who sees a beautiful tree and comments on its beauty stops and smells the roses, so to speak, actually has done something wrong, Pirkei Avot says, because um, they've interrupted their learning to engage in that. Now, I can make a lot of counter arguments to that, um, but let's unpack it a little bit. Can we, miss, can we miss the forest for the trees? Indeed, an overemphasized singularity distracts us from bigger truths that we must hold in our consciousness. To, to catch the singularity of the tree in the midst of a grander thought um, potentially raises, um, uh, begs the question. So trees have a central role in Kabbalah, of course. Avoiding cutting vegetation helps us to focus on the interconnectivity of all life and the oneness of all being. Professor Daniel Matt, who many of you uh, know from translating the Zohar or know personally, or certainly know from our VBM community, um, in his book, God and the Big Bang, writes, maybe I should just stick with tree. But is there, a, is there really a separate self-contained thing I can call by that name? Down below, the roots absorb water and minerals from the soil. Up above, the chlorophyll in the leaves traps and stores the energy of sunlight. The leaf is not separate from the tree. The tree is not separate from the earth and atmosphere. If I pause and reflect, I realize that nothing is entirely separate from anything else. A faint memory of the cosmic seed lingers. And so here we um, explore the notion that separation itself is a facade, is, is an illusion. And so to focus on the singularity, dismissing the interconnectivity um, is spiritually problematic. So we often talk about the elevated status of the human being uniquely created B'Tselem Elohim, in the image of God. But in Hasidus, in Hasidut, it is also true that divinity is infused into all of creation. The, the Baal Shem Tov, the Besht, the founder of Hasidut, as we typically say, writes, or actually he didn't write anything, he says, and is written in his name, this is an important principle. Everything in this world contains the divine sparks. There's nothing in this world that is devoid of these sparks, not even trees and rocks. There are even the sparks from the breaking of vessels in everything we do, even in the sins we commit. And so we have to ask this question, in what way are sparks of holiness similar or different in the human experience from within the broader natural world? Or maybe, that again, that binary itself is problematic, to understand the human as something separate or different from the broader natural world. The Maharal of Prague, Rav Yehuda Lo writes about how interconnectivity offers a new perspective on epistemology, although really hermeneutics and hermeneutics. He describes the multiple ways of understanding biblical texts by drawing on images from the plant kingdom. As you know, pardes, uh, meaning the orchard, um, comes from, just making a note, 
comes from these four different layers, not comes from, actually, from Pardes, we pull out four different layers of how we can interpret text, four different her hermeneutical la layers. So here's what, here's what the Maharal writes. We must never uproot, meaning lose sight of, the pshat, pshat, the literal meaning of a text. Yes, you want to go deeper than the literal meaning, but you never uproot the literal meaning, meaning he writes. It remains intact while the midrash or the drash, the allegorical interpretation, probes the depth of the text. Let me cite a parable to explain this point. The roots of a tree are deeply embedded in the ground, while the tree produces branches, fruit, and leaves. Everything emanates from these roots. The pshat, again, the literal or simple, or simple read, constitutes the root of the text, which expands and expands, sprouting branches in every direction. And so for the, for the Maharal here, the tree inspires or at least helps us reflect on the notion that all of reality has multiple interpretive layers to it, multiple layers of interpretation. And that in those multiple layers or multiple narratives, if we were doing dialogue work, we can see um, that we don't wish to uproot any of those layers as we go deeper. Professor Mordechai Rottenberg in Israel uh, builds off this idea. He writes, the Maharal's metaphor is similar to the one by Hegel. <laughs> okay, I really have to talk about this again after. The Maharal's metaphor is similar to the one by Hegel, he writes, cited in an introduction to his book. Hegel conceives of a conflict. The flower negates the bud and the fruit negates the flower. In contrast, the Maharal brilliantly interprets the word pshat the literal meaning of the biblical text in association with hit pashut, which means expansion. Again, hit pashut, expansion. Both words share a common verb root, pshat, pshat, and hit pashut, expansion, which connotes simplicity. According to the Maharal's metaphor, the tree expands into branches and fruit, all of which stem from the same root. Hence, the apparent contradiction between the literal and the non-literal interpretations does not generate a tension between them in, in representing the truth. They coexist peacefully and enrich our lives. Um, now, I mentioned my, my, um, my, my, my friend, uh, uh, um, Professor Ira, who's on the call here, who pointed out that actually this is a misread. Uh, of, of, of Hegel. But anyways, Hegel is, is used by this professor, uh, Ruttenberg here, uh, not to make the main point, but merely to, to con bracket Hegel, to contrast the idea of, of, um, of an evolution negating the alternative versus holding it. And so here, Ruttenberg is building off a Maharal idea that offering a new layer of truth should not negate a more simple layer of truth, but merely include it. A fascinating midrash explores how the trees, the trees themselves, I love this midrash, feared the creation of the axe precisely because for trees, the act of kotzer creates an existential challenge, if you will. When the word, and here's what it says in the midrash. This is in Genesis Rabbah, Bereshis Rabbah. Uh, a fascin, uh, blah, blah, blah. When the world was created, God first made the trees, of course. Then afterwards, God made iron. The trees shook with terror as they foresaw now the making of the axes and their eventual demise. Said God, don't be afraid. If you give none of your wood, there can be no handles with which to make axes. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, but this existential terror for the trees and the notion that the axes themselves come from them. I mean, if you think of the human condition, the notion that human violence... Um, um, comes from comes from the same human being um, of such of such loving kindness. How do how do we fear ourselves that we ourselves are being of violence to some, beings of violence to some degree, um, while we're beings of peace uh, simultaneously? So Dr. Max Clow, one of my dear friends over in uh, in Cambridge, writes about the work of Dr. Yanir Baryam. I'm guessing none of you have heard of Baryam, but if you have, I would love to I would love to know that. Um, he, his work on complex systems theory. Here's how Clow writes about this, and Clow and I have been talking about this for 20 years, starting in Ghana, Africa. <laughs> Bar Yam's overview of interdependence invites us to consider three different types of systems and imagine what happens when a piece of the system is removed. The first example is a material like a piece of metal or a, gl or a glass of water. In these instances, it is possible to remove a component of the system by cutting off a corner of the metal sheet or removing a spoonful of water from the glass without profoundly changing the system, okay? 
A second example of a more interdependent system is a plant or a tree. Imagine what happens when you cut some roots or branches from a tree. While the tree as a whole may continue to grow, it will surely be impacted by the loss of the part. And the part itself will be profoundly affected. It will die because of the removal. We see an even higher level of interdependence that appears when we look at a more complex system, like an animal. Remove a leg or a lung, and both the animal and the part are, to put it mildly, profoundly affected. Unlike a tree, the attempt to separate almost any component part from the whole in a living animal is sure to have a major impact on both the whole animal and the part that was removed. Now, here's Baryam's voice in the, uh, itself, uh, uh, himself. These three examples show very different kinds of interdependence. Recognizing that these different behaviors exist is an important part of characterizing all of the systems we're interested in. Consider the family or organization you're a part of. How strong are the dependencies between the parts? These are key questions for understanding the system and how we might affect it by our actions. Just asking these questions when we think about our world is an important part of understanding relationships. Now, part of what Bar Yam is getting at here is that when the more simple controls the more complex, the system itself cannot evolve and the system itself may collapse. To give a political example, the masses are more complex than the official up top, obviously, right? I mean, in, I, guess, I guess in a more platonic worldview, it wasn't necessarily true um, that the masses were actually kind of ignorant. And then you have the philosopher king or Aristotelian, the philosopher king actually, who does kind of have it figured out in ways that everyone else doesn't have figured out. But, but looking at today at least, um, and you know, bracketing some of the problem, problematic nature of that notion, although there we were dealing with lack of education as well, nonetheless, there was moral intuition and other factors that weren't honored. In any case, today, um, we understand that if you have a tyranny, if you have a, a despotic leader who's in control, the system can't evolve in a way in a democracy, a true democracy, where the masses have some level, layer of control um, uh, that, uh, where the system can evolve more. And so Baryam would be an advocate for democracy over, over tyranny because of the notion that um, for a whole system to thrive, all the parts have to be liberated into the whole such that um, control is given up um, by uh, something more, something less complex of the more complex. Okay, moving on. Um, just a few more minutes here. So in the broadest sense, we are assumed to, to work the land and take advantage of the availability of vegetation to provide food for our families and for our communities. That's a good thing. In a fascinating midrash, the rabbis specifically reflect on how, if the Messiah is coming in this famous midrash, the Messiah will actually disappear if we stop our planting. Indeed, the redemption of the world cannot emerge without us engaging with the world, and in particular, the vegetative aspect of the world. That's to say that Mashiach is here, Mashiach is here. Don't put your shovel down and stop digging, because then the Mashiach will actually leave. The work needs to coexist with the redemption. We also reflect on our unfortunate destruction of the environment, um, where Jewish law, starting right in Torah Shebechtav, in, in the Torah itself, specifically states in a time of war, famously, we do not destroy fruit trees, right? The whole, this is a reminder here, the whole prohibition, Torah prohibition of Baal Tashchit, of, of being destructive of, of objects, objects in particular, um, emerges from this notion that we can't destroy fruit trees even in a time of war, right? This helps us think about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and olive trees and what happens over there. But this is from, okay, now I'm going to read from Deuteronomy chapter 20, Devarim 20, just verses 19 to 20. When you shall besiege a city a long time in making war against it to take it, right? Again, they, 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 they're, they're not assuming that all warfare is prohibited. Uh, certainly, there is Mechemet uh, Rashut and Mechemet Chova. There's obligated warfare, then there's uh, permitted warfare. Um, in any case, you're in this war. And you shall not destroy its trees by forcing an axe against them. Baal is the, is the language. For you may eat of them, and you shall not cut them down. For is the, for is the tree of the field a man that it, should be, it, it, that it should besiege you by you? It should be besieged by you? Only the trees which you know are not trees for food. You shall destroy and cut them down. And you shall build siege works against the city that makes war with you until it is subdued. Rambam, in, in Mishnah Torah, builds off of this. 
He writes, it's forbidden to chop down fruit trees and to deny, deny them water so they will dry. As it says in the Torah, do not destroy its trees, quoting Devarim. And anyone who does so will be given lashes. <laughs> okay, we'll bracket that part. Th this applies not only during a siege, but in all instances that one chops down a fruit tree in a destructive manner, but one may destroy a fruit tree if it's harming other trees or it's harming the field, field of others or if its maintenance is expensive. The Torah only prohibits destroying trees for the sake of destruction. Any non-fruit bearing trees, one is allowed to destroy even for no purpose. One can do the same for a fruit tree that has aged and bears little fruit and is not worth maintaining. It is permissible to cut it down. So Rambam builds over here on this whole notion of baltashrit, and he has a very expansive list of what it means to destroy. One of his is that if you have a, a can or a jar, uh, any container basically, you can't cut out the bottom of it. That's baltashrit. To make a utensil into a non-utensil, is, is a form of baltashi. Now, today, where we have a recycling industry, we just open cans and, and break bottles and do things like this. Obviously, it's a different reality. Um, but then um, there was, you know, you would keep a, you, if you had a utensil, you'd keep it your whole life, perhaps. So this is true, Rambam, Rambam finishes up. And by the way, this is in the Laws of Kings and the Wars, uh, chapter six, verse, uh, uh, um, sentences eight to 10. Mission Torah. This is true not only of trees, but wh whoever breaks vessels or rips clothing or destroys a building or blocks up a water source uh, or destroys foodstuffs in a destructive manner has violated the prohibition of baltashri, do not be wasteful. And that's why environmentalists, if they want to give a Torah verse, um, if, they don't, if they're not going to look at the Garden of Eden, they will most commonly look at uh, baltashri, the, the prohibition of, of doing anything that destroys that destroys, being wasteful. Okay, last midrash, and we'll wrap up here in two minutes take, and take questions and thoughts. This, this midrash is quite famous from Ecclesiastes Rabbah. When the Holy Blessed, uh, when the Holy Blessed One is created, the first person, created the first person, God took the person and led Adam around all the trees of the Garden of Eden and said to Adam, behold my works, how beautiful and commendable they are. All that I have created for your sake, I created it. Here's the anthropocentric thrust, although anthropocentrism is, anthropocentrism is not everywhere in the text. Here we see it. Pay heed that you do not corrupt and destroy my universe. For if you corrupt it, there is no one to repair it after you. So anyways, to conclude, to be involved in the act of Kotzer means to be caught up with some of the challenging actions and thoughts that plants give us the opportunity to engage in. And so pausing from Kotzer on Shabbat can enable us to recommit to physical conservation and to a notion of spiritual interconnectivity. As we say in Psalms, those who tearfully sow will reap in glad song. Hazorim bedima barina yiksoru. It's, it's the language of Kotzer. We say this over there in, uh, in Benching, in a Shir, Shir Hamalot, right? In the in the uh, Tehillim, in the Psalms, we sing before, on special occasions before the, the grace after meals. We say, Hazorin Badima Barina Yiksoru, the language of Kotzer. Those who tearfully sow will reap in glad song. Actually, I was recent, not, not so recently, but one of my friends had a, uh, still, a, a stillbirth of two uh, of, of twins, just really, really a tragic case. And um, I remember their celebration of their baby they had after the, um, the death of those newborns. And they sang this song, those who tearfully sow will reap in glad song. Hazorim um, bedima barina yiksoru. That our traumas may be turned to glories. And indeed, I give that bracha to everyone here, that your coats here be joyful and may our glories transform our traumas. So, okay, friends, so that is obviously just getting us started. I, I welcome now questions, thoughts, disagreements, uh, whatever you'd like to share in the chat or by unmuting yourself. Rabbi, why do they give 39 prohibitions for the Sabbath and not give you what you should do and just say, and everything else is forbidden? Okay, thank you for that. You, um, you make a good point, Eileen, that oftentimes we talk about the, um, the low ta'ase more than the ase. We often talk more about the things not to do than the things to do. And their assumption is, um, like anyone who has a meditation practice here, that by silencing certain 
um, certain thoughts, we open a whole new space for a whole new realm. And so they're less focused on the things not to do than they are on creating a, a new space to do. And they think that can only be achieved if we're not surfing Facebook and gardening um, and cooking elaborate meals and doing all these things. Um, again, in a pluralistic fashion, we validate and celebrate different ways to embrace Shabbat. Um, but the traditional framework was definitely building off that. You're right that we don't talk enough about the assays, about the um, about the chala and the kiddush and the realm of tefillah of prayer and all the beautiful things that can happen. And um, as my friend here, Cheryl, said, reminded me recently, you know, the um, the importance of of marital relations, of sexual relations on Shabbat, and other things that bring joy and connectivity. Um, and so that is a whole other section. The 39 things specifically to do on Shabbat, we could say. But Eileen, it's a good, it's a good point. So thank you for that. Someone else? I see people on mute. Are they able to unmute themselves? I yeah. assume they can. Probably. Yes, hi, Cheryl. Hi. Um, what, what if uh, I'm going back to that, that the uh, scholar who's studying, studying as he's walking and pauses to, oh, yes. <laughs> um, but just taking it a bit further, what if he, what if, if there's somebody who's walking, who's starving who's mm. hungry and passes a fruit tree and it happens to be Shabbat? I mean, mm. I mean, wouldn't that, that's, you know, <laughs> isn't that like pikuach nefesh or something mm -hmm. like that? You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, well, well without a doubt, without a doubt, um, one of the beautiful things is that pikuach nefesh in every traditional sense overrides Shabbat. The value of saving one's life or someone else's life, even to the extent that those who are most stringent about Shabbat legal practices argue that not only can a doctor or nurse or any medical professional um, obviously um, drive to their, to their work when needed, but they can even drive home lest it become a deterrent that people would feel stuck. Um, and so every notion of pikuach nefesh, and most certainly someone who was, uh, was starving who needed to pull a fruit off a tree, most certainly um, that would be not only acceptable, but, 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 uh, but commendable as, as Yisrael Salanter famously, um, uh, you know, did on Yom Kippur, ate in front of his congregation, um, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, during a, a troubling time, uh, in order to demonstrate the importance of, of never taking any risks with our, with our, with our lives. So yeah, so great point, Cheryl. Thank you for that. Shmuley, it's Mona Fishbane. Hi, how are you? Wonderful, thank you for your teaching. Um, you. I'm wondering how pruning fits in with this. I mean, mm. I, if, I, if I have um, perennials or whatever, uh, or even just, let's say, my basil plant in a, in a pot, if I don't prune it, it will actually die or will not flourish. And there are ways of pruning that will allow the plant to flourish, and there are ways of pruning that aren't. There's times to do it, there's ways mm. to do it. So I'm wondering uh, about that both halachically and also in terms of the implications for, let's say, the more spiritual things you've been talking about. Okay, wonderful. Well, if you have a thought on that, I'd love to hear it because I'm gonna I'm gonna bracket the pruning question for when we get to that later in the series, um, and I'm I'm gonna make a note of it. Um, what's that? Pruning is separate from kotzer. Right. Saying? Yes. Um, uh, one second. I want to pull up my note on that. Um, so I, I, um, I, I have, um, something that I'm 90% sure about, but I'm actually at the moment, um, not sure enough to actually say it. So I'm going to bracket it and return to it. Uh, later, uh, but I, I just want to look at one thing here. Um, sorry for the delay. Yes. So uh, yeah. So I I I am working off the assumption right now. Yes, that pruning is something we're going to return to. So I so I do want to bracket it because I do have some notes I want to share at the right time on that. Um, so um, with your permission, we'll, we'll we'll come back to that one. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Rabbi. Yes. I have a question from Mark Biller in the chat, and he asked. Sure. 
Will you say a bit more about the separating the tree of life from the tree of knowledge of good of evil? Good and evil. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay, great. Yes. So um, just to remind folks of what Rabbi Biller's writing about over there, this was from the passage in Art Green that we mentioned um, that said that the, the problem here was separation, separation, breaking apart the unity of being. In this case, in particular, the tree of eternal life with the tree of knowledge, Eitz Hadat Tovira. Um, and so... Um, as, as opposed to, to the Eitz Chaim, to the, to the tree of eternal life. And so actually I want to throw that question back for the moment because I think it's such a huge question to see if anyone has a reflection on that. The notion that these two trees in the Garden of Eden, these two exceptional trees, um, the tree of eternal life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil um, are interconnected and that, um, that the sin was not eating that fruit but by doing it, it was separating those two trees. And I'll add one thought while you're thinking about that. Rabbi Yadin Steinzoltz um, uh, pointed out that um, um, Adam and Eve, Adam and Chava, were not expelled immediately from the Garden of Eden. And so um, uh, why didn't they, after being told they were going to be expelled, why didn't they go eat from the Etzchayim? Why didn't they go eat from the, the tree of eternal life? And, uh, and Rabbi Adin Steinzel's answer is very interesting there. He says that sometimes when we grasp complex truth, we lose the simple truths. And so it was so obvious that now that they were made mortal, that if they ate from the tree of eternal life, they would be immortal. But because they had eaten from the tree of knowledge, they had su such complex ideas that they lost uh, simple truths. And this is a really important point for those of us here who are engaged in the world of critical thought as rabbis, as academics, as, um, as any field where we're intellectually engaged. Um, that um, the, one of the ways I like to explain the relationship of, of progress to truth in, in Jewish thought, well, let me lay out the, three, the, the four, three possibilities first. The first possibility is called Yuridata Dorot. That is to say that we have declined in our truth, right? People used to have truth at Sinai in the Garden of Eden, and we're getting further and further from truth, from Sinai and from Garden of Eden, right? Yurida Tadorot. The second notion, which we're more familiar with in the 21st century, is a notion of progress in relationship to truth, that we know more than we ever did. We know more than we ever did. Um, and it's a linear progress that uh, in science, in research, um, in all kinds of fields, even one might say in religion, um, we know more than we ever did. Um, the, third, the third approach would be not to be linear, um, either, um, either as a urida, as a decline, or as progress, but something cyclical, that there is no progress at all. I mean, um, and there's a lot to say about that. But the, one I, but the one I wanna suggest in relation to this point here, then I wanna open up around this great question, is um, that we have progressed in our ability to grasp complex truths. We hold a lot of relationships. We hold a lot of complex data. The average American, just, let's, just look at Americans, the average American holds on to a lot of knowledge um, uh, that's unprecedented in history, um, even those who are the least educated. Um, and yet, we have declined in our ability to hold simple truths that simple, simple truths um, like the oneness of God or the power of love or um, uh, simple truth telling, so to speak, um, we have declined in our ability to kind of live with those simple truths to some degree. Okay, so with that, I wanna open back up Rabbi Biller's question as to if Ra uh, Rabbi Dr. Art Green suggests there's a problem with separating the tree of knowledge from the tree of life. And Rabbi Biller says, well, what's that problem? And so any thoughts on that? Yeah, Michael Evers has a question. Okay. Uh, hi there, Rabbi Yankowitz. Thank you. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I guess this is on your last point that I have a question of, which is that third sort of, which is like that third model to get clarification on that. Does that have to do with like Tamar Ross's idea 
of an unfolding of theology, just because with Rabbi Biller's question, wouldn't it be that, um, like what you're saying is we deconstruct everything now to the point that we can't say any simple truths without analyzing it, right? But isn't there a way to maybe say in terms of a, for lack of a better word, and if this is too abstract, let me know, but in terms of a historical process unfolding that in the way that Dr. Martin Luther King used to talk about, like the arc of justice is so long that there's actually a timeline on these things that we can't necessarily see the end result. And therefore the idea of like separating the tree of life and the tree of knowledge and all this kind of thing, like might actually not be a separation at all, but only from our perspective. I don't know if that's like too much, but that's kind of the thought that comes up for me based on that question and the way you outline like the three approaches there. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much for that. Okay, I love that. And, 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 and I'm so tempted to jump into your relationship to the trees, but I, I don't want to yet because I want to leave more space for others to do that. But I do want to, I do want to uh, take the bait on, on Tamar Ross because I think it's, it, it, is, it is very relevant. And just to re remind folks who haven't read that in a while or who have never read it, her important book, Expanding the Palace of Torah, which primarily through a, a lens of, of Rav Cook um, and through the lens of feminism, argues that um, new forms of progress in society um, should not be deemed a threat to Torah and to traditionalism, but as an opportunity for the expansion of Torah. Okay, so we now have this new thing called democracy. We don't have to go and try to pretend it was really built into the monarchy model that once existed, um, although certainly there were early democratic roots uh, in the Torah, as Michael Walzer uh, 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 most uh, eloquently lays out, and I interviewed him on that topic just two months ago. He points out four to five different roots of democracy that, that are found in Torah. Um, but actually, we can say, oh, there's a new phenomenon here in the world of politics, socialism, capitalism, uh, democracy, uh, various, various things that emerge from there. And actually, there may be something good here. Um, and we have to do, I mean, it's a lot to unpack as to what's good. Um, uh, but, um, but, but Torah can expand by embracing that. We don't have to have a binary or a contradiction of should Israel be democratic or Jewish? As if, like, we have to choose. It's going to be Jewish and not democratic, and it's going to suppress citizen, you know, cert, uh, citizenship and rights of voting. Or it's going to be democratic and thus lose its Jewishness. Actually, how could, how could democracy itself be a Jewish notion? And Tamar Ross says this can happen. And more, more, uh, more forcefully, she argues for feminism in regards to how, yes, you can do some acrobatics to show that feminism exists in earlier traditional sources. Uh, certainly... Um, some things that would be more advanced than surrounding societies. Um, but, you know, the birth of modern feminism as we know it, I mean, geez, the first, uh, f forget even that Orthodox women rabbis are only, you know, two decades old. The first reform women rabbis in the 70s. Actually, there was someone in Germany, there was a woman in Germany who nobody really talks about, but she, um, in, during the Shoah, got smicha in the 40s, it seems. Um, but, but really, you know, institutional ordination for a reform woman was in the 70s, and we're talking le less than 50 years. So um, feminism is, is a very new thing, um, like, like a lot of the notions of social progress we might identify. And, she, and Tamar Ross all, uh, argues that this is, this is and, and through the lens of freedom, that progress through the lens of freedom, not truth like we were talking about, is something to be celebrated, and that it makes Torah greater. Torah comes to include it. And so, um, and so, yes, I do think that uh, that Tamar Ross there is not dealing with truth, but with freedom. But it is very relevant to that uh, to that idea. And anyways, so I want to spin us back. I want to spin us back to Rabbi Biller's question and where Michael was just uh, leading us uh, to that back to that relationship. If anyone wants to weigh in there. Can I offer an idea that just came to me? Yes, yeah, who's speaking? Yeah, it's Mark Biller. Oh, yes. Oh, hi, Rabbi yeah. Biller. Yes, please. Yeah. Hi, how are you doing? Um, it just hit me. A very extreme example would be Germany, Nazi Germany, which was the yes, height exactly, of exactly. culture, yes. uh, technology, 
but no no respect for life and that was the tree of knowledge yes. although they didn't have the tree of knowledge of the difference between good and evil they had the tree of knowledge but uh, anyhow I, 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 exactly that was one of the main directions i wanted to go and i wanted to see where else we'd go first but you're exactly right that when life and knowledge are disconnected you have yeah. the atrocity of the shoah right that you could have an enlightened society that is has brilliant philosophers um and um you know heidegger and and and, and everyone else and and yet um and yet are are capable of completely missing the dignity um and value of life and that of course is what levinas and so many others are responding to that actually knowledge is not the place we want to to root mm -hmm. our our value of life it has to have, happen in the, con the concrete encounter of the human face um, almost returning us back to our, our flesh rather than to our minds in a sense. So thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Biller. I think that's, that's a, that it, it, it's a brilliant point that now, now, and you might even say, uh, although, although here's the interesting thing there. Um, it's not just Eitz Hadat. It's not the tree of knowledge. We oftentimes shorten and call that. It's Eitz Hadat Tovera. It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. Right, so it's not just you know mathematics. No, you know nothing against mathematics, um, but um, but but it is it is um, it is the realm of knowledge that deals with ethics itself, and so um, nonetheless, uh, metaphysics um, that are, is detached from the Eitzchayim, from 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 life. And here next week we'll talk about lived experience more more deeply. Um, is is the great danger, um, and it leads to mortality. That's exactly the point, that mortality is not the punishment in leaving God, Garden of Eden, but the inevitability that happens when you separate life from knowledge, uh, knowledge of ethics is that inevitably it leads to death. It leads to mortality. Hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, um, I, yes. Another thought is, is I'm, I'm walking on the road and I see this food on the tree and I want to pick it because it's for me and I'm hungry. <laughs> so that's about me. <laughs> yeah. And I think what, what, what you're teaching is really about my, my awareness of um, my place in the larger system yeah. and that sense of humility that that tree isn't just there for me. That tree has a life of its own. Maybe it's right. involved in the community right. or whatever, whatever the purpose is, but it's not just uh, oriented towards me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love that. I love that. That, that, yeah, that responding to the anthropocentric worldview itself is seeing this as a form of life beyond me. That's not here for me. You know, it's interesting. You talked about the fruit. I mean, we're, we're, we're fortunate, I guess, and unfortunate, but mostly fortunate. I mean, highly, highly fortunate to have a grapefruit tree in our backyard. Because <laughs> like, there's so many layers of, of, of being, being privileged and being fortunate to have a backyard and to have a tree and to have a grapefruit tree. We just don't like grapefruits. So it's really annoying. They fall all the time and they're all over the place and then they get, you know, gross. And, but on Shabbat, our kids always want me to lift them up and pick them. And I explain this is the one day we're going to look at them and appreciate them, but not actually pull them off the tree. And um, Rav Cook himself actually felt we should never pick a flower off the bush um, and, uh, you know, during the week. Now, now, that's not to say that you know, you're picking the flowers because you're putting it in a vase or whatever the case is. But actually, the person who just wants to pick it and kind of smell it and then throw it on the ground or you know, put it in their pocket, whatever the case is, um, he, he, he was opposed to any, any uh, picking of vegetation um, unless there was a, a very direct uh, a very direct need. And uh, this is related to just how sensitive we are to life. You know, there were a number of Hasidim who would not, um, who write about how they have bug bites all over their arms because they, they refuse to kill bugs. Um, maybe you're one of those people on the call. I, I, at one point in my life, lived by such a spiritually enlightened worldview and at other times have, um, have cert most certainly not. Uh, now we're at a place where we have a vacuum uh, you can buy a bug vacuum for 19 bucks on Amazon where you see the bug and you can just zap it into the vacuum and then release it, release it outside. So that's a way of, of really, oh, but we're going to get to trapping. One of the, one of the, the, the malachot deals with trapping. So we'll, we'll get back to this issue of trapping. There's a, whoa, a lot to build off there. But yeah, so, um, but Dr. Fishman, your point, your point is excellent here. And I think that um, what I want to, what I want to argue here, and I welcome a lot of pushback, is that, um, we should live in an anthropocentric universe, um, six days of the week. We should feel charged and responsible and centralized 
as human beings in, um, in our work of the world. Um, and, and embrace that the, the world is radically unequal um, on every la layer, the global south and the global north, on, 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 on gender, on race, um, and the like. Uh, and not, not embrace that as okay, um, but, but, but embrace that that's the messiness of the world that we live in. And unless there's some Mashiach or utopia, um, that that's the world we live in. And then on Shabbat, we pretend the world is perfect. We live in a utopia. I mean, I mean Yitz Greenberg has written on that stuff for decades, that on, on Shabbat, we, 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 we pretend that we live in a perfected world rather than in that broken world. And so too, we re-center ourselves toward an egalitarian framework. That, that everything is equal, that, there, that we don't, that we don't, we're not, we don't exist in an anthropocentric framework, that, that, that flower or that fruit itself has a value that's beyond me. And I, um, you know, yes, I have the right to the fruit I picked yesterday, but the fruit that I picked today is not, is not really for me. For me, I observe, I, I bear witness, I bear test, I, I, I give testimony, I, I stand before the fruit, but it's not there for me. And then I return to a world of exploitation where all of us are complicit in exploitation of, of people, of animals, and of products. Um, and I can't remove myself from being complicit in that, uh, except for that one day. Could, could I add something to that? I, I sure hope you will. All right, so like, I want to bring from Shabbat into the weekday that awareness. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. not just anything goes during the yes, week. Yes, exactly. So right. Kitchen, rocks. Yes. Six days a week. It's that I'm tempered. My exploitation is yes. tempered by my awareness of Shabbat and of what you were just saying. Yes, exactly. I, that is the hope that that um, that we that we need to um, to own. We own our complicity. We need to actually see those problems, and Shabbat can sensitize sensitize us to realizing just how exploitative um, that world is. And that we don't realize in the realm of labor, in the realm of the environment, in the, in, in the, in the realm of animal welfare, in, in the realm of self-exploitation or allow, allowing others to exploit us, just how transactional the world is. Um, and, um, and so it, it doesn't mean we, we pretend and then up, oh, fake out, back to my, my, my right to exploit, but rather you're exactly right, that we see it and we own it and we're deeply sensitized to return to it differently. And so, and so maybe I still pull that fruit when I'm hungry, but maybe I don't pull it because I want to just smell it and experience it and then throw it away. Um, it's almost like um, fishing. And now I'm someone who doesn't eat fish, but um, uh, there's something, it, it's actually interesting. I like when I, my, I see my kids witness fishing and I can say, oh, that one, that guy just caught a fish and he's throwing it back. Don't worry, they're not going to kill the fish, they're going to throw it back. But in some ways in this relationship, it's actually worse. Um, the one who's getting the fish to eat, to, to need to eat the fish is doing something different than the one who's having a game. I, I'm pulling off the flower to smell it and throw it away, uh, you know, uh, uh, to smell the fruit and throw it away, as opposed to I want to consume it. The consumption is in some ways less violent than the experience and disposal. Um, so, you know, um, that, that fish now has a hole in it and now is tossed back in. Okay, oh, let's open it back up. We've got 15 minutes left. This is Michael Evers again, and Welcome. I'll just bang. Thank you. But how do you do? How do you deal then with the the guilt or this? Like, is it a sinful nature? Like, you can't bring like. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but like, you can't bring like then a sacrifice, right? To like atone or make up for what you did, and that might cause more guilt. Like, I guess. I guess my question would then be. How do you make up for what you take? Oh, oh, that that is I love that, and that is way beyond the scope of this. But I, and I, and I, but um, but I think I just want to elevate how important the question is, of how do we do tshuva, how do we repent for being complicit, when when our act is indirect, um, when uh, when we are a part of vicious capitalism, how do I do tshuva for that? How do I repent for being a part of that? when we are um, knowingly uh, a part of systems of exploitation. Uh, am, 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 I, am, I, am I stating your question correctly? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like you're, you're so, carrying around yeah. guilt or whatever all that, like you gotta, 
You're okay, good. You're oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Excellent. So, so I would offer three approaches and I would welcome some others. Um, the first I would call ascetic. The second I would call minimizing. And the third I'd call tikkun. Ascetic means I'm going to do tshuva by refraining. Oh my goodness. Like I'm just eating unjust stuff or I've been in, I've been engaged in, in pleasurable activity, which, which gives me guilt. Um, you know, forget, forget when it gets more complex, like white privilege and things like that, right? Um, or patriarchy or, or things that are much more intangible than things like, I just, I just bought a blood diamond or I am um, eating chocolate that's not fair trade or the like. Um, so the ascetic, the ascetic realm would say, I'm gonna fast. I'm gonna fast to purify myself from, from that experience. And Judaism, it's overstated that Judaism is not centrally ascetic. Of course, it's not centrally ascetic, but the, the ascetic strands within Jewish thought are so rich. They're so rich around how we limit our fulfilling all of our desires and even limit uh, fulfilling of any desires at times in order to achieve that purity of mind. And purity might be too strong, a purification perhaps. The second is minimizing to say, look, I'm aware that um, even after my fast or, or after all this, that this problem still exists, but I'm going to try to limit how much I'm benefiting from such a system. I'm going to live um, with some more limitations in place rather than just with what American life often experiences is, experienced by the rest of the world is just total hedonism. Basically, anything you can afford to consume has no limits um, in, uh, in terms of your rights to consume as you please. Um, and then the third I would call tikkun. Tikkun mean actually trying to repair the problem. Now, we might not all be activists in this regard, um, but um, th there's two forms of tikkun here, past looking and future looking. Um, the, the past will be to actually go to some of these people who have been harmed by uh, such kotzer um, and try to fix that. Um, um, you know, the, the future looking one is to try to f correct those systems that are, are uh, continuing to allow and even validate such exploitation. And so that's a very imperfect answer to a huge question I think about all the time around, um, we know about tshuva and things we directly did harm. I said something mean to someone, I need to go to them and ask for forgiveness, right? I stole from someone, I need to return that object. But when we do indirect harm, when we are complicit within a system where we ourselves are, um, you know, as Heschel famously says, not guilty but responsible, um, how do we um, think about that as we approach Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? So I want to—I—I—I I, I, I gave no answer. I just offered a few, few potential frameworks and hope the question stays alive. Cool. Someone Can I else? Make a, yes, please. Yes, oh. please. Yes, please. Um, so I was just going to add to the tikkun. Mm -hmm. I always like a tikkun of like for like. So in other words, if you think that um, environmentally too many trees are being destroyed, mm -hmm. being involved in planting trees and contributing to the planting of trees, you know, like the JNF did. Um, if, if you're worried about white mm -hmm. uh, privilege, mm -hmm. get, um, get involved with things like Black Lives Matter or with indigenous people. But um, to me, that's like the, the best form of, of tikkun. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for that. You're right. Because you, because you really can look forward, Lauren. I appreciate that so much because, because looking back, I mean, we have these complex models. I mean, let's just take a minute on something that deserves 20 hours to, you know, tr that you have the truth and reconciliation process of South Africa where um, they're not asking to make payments. They want to be heard. They want to, ex there's an experience they think the country should go through. Then you look at German reparations, you know, actual money being involved in something that can never be, you know, monetized. And then you look at the call for slave reparations in America. Three very different um, approaches. How do we correct, how do we correct slavery in America, right? Is it through slave reparations, right? Is it through various forms of legislation? Is it through affirmative action? I mean, do we go through a truth and reconciliation process where everyone, you know, where, uh, you know, fill in the blank? I mean, um, and then the, you know, the, the, the German reparations process. I mean, looking, comparing just those three models from the 20th century, and again, I mean, America hasn't done anything, I shouldn't say anything, but virtually nothing to actually really um, look at what um, the consequences of slavery and kind of take any ownership 
of how America is what it is today, based upon building, being built upon the, the backs of slaves. And we don't have to see the play Hamilton to understand that. Um, I mean, you, you know, if you look at just the, you know, um, the, the, the gap in wealth, the income disparity, people of color and white people in America, um, you, can quite, you can quite clearly see. If you look at America's advantage over other countries that, that, were, that didn't have as much uh, um, you know, slave labor involved, of course, there's more to it than all this. But you're right. But anyways, go, Lauren, going back to your point there, you're right. Something like that um, to say like, look, I'm going to consume paper in my life, but I'm going to plant trees. I'm going to plant trees. Yes, I might choose to limit or not limit, but I'm also going to be a part of a planting process, I think is, is really interesting. And that's why part of the code sayer consciousness can, can return us to a week not just of sensitizing how we pick, but a commitment to planting. I, so I, I appreciate that point very much. Seven minutes left, a few more thoughts. Hi, it's uh, Neil Thomas Daniels. Hi, Smulin. Hi. Hi, Professor hey. Allen. How are you? Um, uh, I, um, I think a little bit more about limiting in the garden. Um, uh, is self-limiting. Uh, and what's at stake in the decision or... or you know, I mean, if you think of it as passing over the simple truth, I, you know, sort of failing to eat of the tree of life, you, you end up with one, one perspective. And if you think of it as a decision not to eat of the tree of life, because having eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you have, there's an in, moral intuition uh, that no being that has the knowledge. Well, then you're muted. You're muted again. Sorry. Um, access to of the tree of eternal life uh, right so the, the so if you think of the right. you, you end up with two very different yes. ways of, of right. leaving the garden one is sort of passing over a simple truth the other is sort of not eating of the tree of life because of an apprehension of a very complex moral truth which is that I myself although I might do better um, by eating of the tree of life, in as much as I, I am failing in certain ways, in as much as I'm, I'm sort of a morally complex, complicit kind of animal um, who has eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, ought not, ought to refrain perhaps from uh, uh, something that would be the fullest enjoyment of life, i.e. immortality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that, that, there's a lot to build off there. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to leave space for a few more questions and thoughts, but I want to actually unpack what you said a, a, more later. So thank you. Someone else? Yeah, Neil has a question. Great. Well, I have a question. I just wanted to, to say that I can't, you know, get out of my head that, that beautiful image of, of the whole tree. You know, and I guess it was Rob yeah. saying that you can't, you know, you can't ignore the roots that, um, you know, the, the minute that you're seduced to one part of the tree in terms of your tikkun in the world, in terms of the way you interact with the world, um, you know, you, 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 you get focused on that and you say how wonderful this fruit is and I'm going to make jam out of it and so on and so forth, you know, but you can't. I mean, I, I guess the Shabbat responsibility that comes through mm. is that, you know, Kotzer is a very complex process too, you know, that, that it just doesn't have to do with, you know, with what you harvest. It doesn't have to do with what you reap. It has to do with the whole process and the cyclical process. And you, you know, it, it, it's a, it's truly, I'm oh, sorry, I'm, I got my microphone away. It's truly a consciousness. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that we have to engage in. So, I love that. Yeah, I love that. And, and imagine if we took that um, to, the, to, the, to human encounters as well, oh, that, right. that, 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 that you see, uh, as Rabbi Neil saying here, you see the fullness of the tree. Imagine if we saw the fullness of other beings, right? Um, if we saw the fullness of other beings and we encounter, I mean, just look at, I mean, look, like look at, I mean, sort of the most extreme or an obvious example. Um, Look at, think about like a sexual experience, right? It, it, that one is, one is attracted or desires like a physical body part of another. But imagine if in an intimate encounter, 
One was attracted to the fullness of the person. Like what would happen in an intimate experience, sexual or non-sexual, if one is attracted to the fullness of the being of the person rather than to a part of the person. So too with the tree, when we can't see the tree as parts, we see the fullness of it. And I think that's part of what's happening here. That the, the code there, the separating is, is reminding us that like there's a fullness there and we can miss the forest for the trees. We can miss the, the, the tree for the fruit. We can miss the person for their nose, right? Um, and um, it's not only in the interconnected, uh, interconnected interconnectivity of systems, the inter interconnectivity of life, but the fullness of being in front of us and what it means to encounter that. Um, and this has to do with relationships, as we just said, intimacy, but also it can have to do with uh, how we think of education, that we want to educate the fullness of the being, right? We're not just teaching someone a skill. I mean, there might be a time we're teaching a, a skill, but to honor the fullness of the person. Um, and so coats there, we might not have thought that just the idea of, you know, <laughs> picking a grapefruit off the tree uh, could be challenging us to, re to return to that. Um, now, the brisker right. methodology of interpretation um, pushes us to break things down, break every idea into parts. But in some ways, we, um, in an analytical process, need to do that. And in other ways, um, when we break things down, we can lose focus of the core itself. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, friends, I, um, I wish everyone a bracha for a great, uh, a great day, a great week. I'm very grateful for you to spend this time, this time with us, this time with me. And uh, next week, um, um, we are uh, moving forward to gathering. A lot to say on gathering um, and how we think of how we form um, how we come to ethical conclusions based upon a gathering process. As always, send feedback, thoughts, questions, anything else in between now and then. Other than that, until next time, thank you all so much. Be well. Have a great day.